Hi guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we will be discussing the OCCRP Aleph system with its lead data editor. The, the interesting thing about Aleph, which is a global archive of leaks uh, that cross hundreds of countries and hundreds of databases is the, 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 the critical nature of this information, which we call data, but it could be a tax receipt, an email, um, it could be a company filing, that basically human beings are predictive. We are creatures of habit, even where we try to make a system more efficient or disrupt an existing system, we inevitably create a new pattern. So if you're an investigator and you're looking into a specific technique of a company or person, there's a probable chance that the same technique or pattern may be reproduced in other jurisdictions. And that's why being able to access this kind of a database is so critical, especially if it comes at no cost or when you file for a researcher um, to look into certain things in countries where you are not present or you don't have colleagues, it can also come at a very low or free cost. Um, the, the data editor who's with us today is Jan. He's based in Germany. He recently joined OCCRP in 2021, uh, working with the editorial and data teams as an investigator, a coordinator uh, on analysis, especially on the big projects. He's worked on Luxembourg leaks, Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, uh, and other major cross-border stories. Um, Jan is an award-winning journalist uh, and editor, and we are very lucky to have him at OCCRP. Uh, he'll take it away now. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was very kind. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm Jan. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit around Aleph, which is the main data tool that we use at OCCRP. Um, this is, session is um, going to be a little bit of an intro, then a little bit of hands-on, where I show you how we use this tool, where I make real-life examples, uh, which you can reproduce, reproduce in your own investigations as well. And then we're going to have time for a few questions, a little bit of discussion, and maybe um, we will also show you a few of the data sets that you normally would not be able to see. Um, I'm going to share my screen for this right now. Uh, OK, so um, make this a little bit brighter for myself. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, let's start with an intro to uh, our data tool, Aleph. First, I would like to spend only a few seconds on the organization that I'm working for. Uh, OCCRP is short for the very complicated uh, string organized crime and corruption reporting project. We have a mission which is copied from our homepage here. You can read it yourself. We are a growing organization. I recently joined. We have a lot of new colleagues joining as well. We are around 50 local member centers at the moment, and I think even 150 team and staff right now. Mm, with a no nominal headquarter in Sarajevo in Bosnia, which is not as important as it was before the pandemic. Um, so what is Aleph? Aleph is a, first of all, it's an investigative platform, a data platform that was built around the idea that most of our investigations as OCCRP are somehow investigations that follow the money. So you would like to figure out more about company ownership. You would like to be able to visualize maybe networks. You would like to cross-reference data. That is all stuff that Aleph can do. If we talk about Aleph, and this is just a technical um, definition, basically, we mean two things. There's one thing that is the software. So the program, the software itself is called Aleph. 
it's a search engine, a Google-like search in, engine, basically, for large amounts of data, structured and unstructured data. These are important terms, um, which I'm going to talk about later a little bit. Uh, it's capable of cross-referencing data sets, so it will find um, it will find people that are in one data set uh, if they are also present in a different data set of yourself, of your own investigations, and also of publicly available data. It also includes a control and permission system where you can work in teams and you can share your information with colleagues or you can make sure that only the right people see what you, for example, uploaded. And it can also be self-hosted. So technically, Aleph means the software. If I'm in the next hour that we speak about it, when I say Aleph, I basically mean our version of the software that we run on OCCRP servers. Um, so that's the same software that you can also run yourself. But it comes with a, it comes filled with data. Basically, um, we have uh, around three hundred, a bit, a bit over three hundred public data sets right now. We um, run a lot of scrapers in the background, so uh, these scrapers basically go to automatically go to websites, copy I don't know company registry information. They copy. Uh, real estate information, they copy vessel and aircraft ownership information, stuff like this. They update the data sets on our side of things. And um, so you will always, whenever you log in, you will always have the, the updated, hopefully always the updated version of the data. This spans around 250 countries, uh, a lot of people, entities. I'm going to discuss the term entity and why it's important uh, in a minute. Uh, a lot of companies, obviously, and also a growing field of real estate information as well, which is also very interesting to a lot of people. Um, we do have a historic connection, or let's let's say differently. OCCRP historically was focused on the Balkans area, uh, Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, former Soviet countries. We do have growing and ever-growing um, data sets from African countries as well. Here are just a few examples of stuff that might be of interest for uh, African investigations. We do obviously have company registries. Uh, we do have a lot of procurement data. Mining and extraction licenses is something that, oh, there's a little typo there, sorry for that. Um, mining and extraction licenses um, is something that we've been working on recently and we've added quite a few of them. Uh, we do have, for example, non-political organizations from South, South Africa. We do have uh, data from the Rwanda leagues um, and more. And you will see some of these examples in a second. And on top of that, Aleph comes with a lot of data sets that might be interest of interest to, um, to all types of investigations that are not necessarily uh, focused on a specific region. Like we have structured data from the Panama Papers that basically goes around the world, more or less. We do have some data from Interpol, WikiLeaks, we do have sanctions lists. We do have different types of, we do have different types of aircraft and shipping registries, real estate information that is uh, also of interest if, if uh, you're working on follow the money investigations because a lot of these people end up uh, invest investing their money in real estate or maybe in yards or private jets or whatever, it's all the fancy stuff. Um, okay, so why would you want Aleph to to use? Why, why would you use Aleph as a tool for for these investigations? Um, I'd like to show you a little graphic that my colleague Eric did uh, a while ago. So uh, on top, the, the data iceberg. So on top is what people usually see, and by people I mean the audience, right? Not the not the reporters, not the investigators themselves, but the audience. So if a nice story comes out, if let's say the Pandora Papers or the Luanda Leaks are published, what people see is obviously the reporting, some of the analysis, sometimes they see a nice map, maybe a fancy diagram, maybe even like an interactive graphic where you can move stuff back and forth a little bit and then changes on the screen. So, um, but where, and this is from my experience and also from the experience of my colleagues, I think where most of the work uh, in, uh, in stories lies that are based on data and data sets that is below the waterline here. So it's the extraction of data from a ton of files that you get. get. It's the conversion, it's the OCR process, which is um, 
short for optical character recognition. So it means if you have a PDF file or a image file and there's text on it, you tell the computer, or the computer tries to figure out what the text means and makes it readable. Uh, you need to pass the data, you need to clean it, uh, get rid of duplicates, stuff like this. So Aleph is really, really powerful in what is below the waterline here. And it helps you obviously to create uh, um, successful publications and su successful, um, well, maps, diagrams, analysis, the stuff that's about, above the waterline here. Hopefully it helps. Um, that means in real life, I mean, these are real life examples, right? This is stuff that we as reporters, as investigative reporters have to work with. So you have some kind of table, you have a lot of files that are in a folder. I copied this, this is just a screenshot. It's, it, it's, it's random, you don't have to read what's on there, but it's just, it's just a kind of a stock image for a lot of unstructured and unorganized data, sometimes even on paper. So if you, you've got to scan it, obviously, to work in Aleph with it. Aleph does not uh, work with paper yet. Maybe <laughs> maybe we should work on an extension. And the idea is to basically start out with something similar to this, probably even way more than this. So in most cases, you're going to have a lot more stuff. And then you end up with something that's nice and easy to, to understand and that easily shows you a connection, like the, the diagram on the right side of, uh, of, the, of the screen right now, where you can now see that someone uh, is connected to an apartment in this case, or that two companies are interconnected between, between each other, or the profile that you see on the left side. That this is also something that Aleph can generate, where you would start out with a lot of information, probably in a spreadsheet or in a Excel file of, of, of some type. And then Aleph would help you generate these very nice profiles from it, which, which help you um, go forward with your investigation and focus on the important stuff and leave out the not so important stuff. Um, okay, um, I'm going to show you in the hands on part of this, I'm going to show you um, the search in the beginning. So I think I said Aleph is a little bit like Google, Google kind of search platform, which is only half of the truth, but it's true. So we're going to do a little bit of search and filtering from searches and then some alerts that you can set for yourself. So you get emails if someone shows up in new data. Um, in, the, in this part, I'm also going to talk a little bit more about entities and why this is an important concept to, to data journalism. And I'm going to show you what a data set is and why it's uh, is interesting for you. And then in the second part, we're going to do our own little demo investigation where I show you how to upload documents of your own, how you can process them or make Aleph process them, basically, how you create entities from these files. So we end up with something that looks a bit more like this. Um, Cross-reference, obviously. So how can you figure out if these uh, entities also show up in other data sets? And then in the end, we are also going to create a diagram or a timeline, maybe both, depends on how we are in time. Um, and then we're gonna have some time for questions as well, I guess. Oops, sorry, let me switch the, the uh, tab now. So I'm gonna click on this tab. This is what, you, let me reload this, okay. So this is what you see if you log into Aleph for the first time, not, not the first time, but if you log in as a, as a new user, this is the basic, basic interface overview. Um, is that, uh, readable? Can someone, maybe Khadisha or someone, can you tell me if that's okay or do I have to enlarge this? Because I'm going to show a little bit of what these buttons mean and if people can't read it, that's going to be annoying, I guess. I can maybe make it a little bit larger? No, no, it's, it's quite readable. Is it? It's okay, readable. great, cool. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, the, probably the easiest thing you, you can do is that you just go to this main page and then you go to the top search bar, which is, yeah, it, it's a very straightforward thing. And you just type something in, let's say, um, back in my old job, when I was working for the Northern German television, I was working on a on the Steinhoff case, the Markus Joost, South African German business fraud case. Um, so let's just type in Steinhoff, maybe. It's a and it, it already gives you more than 3,000. I don't know if you can see this here, but it says 3,141 results. So uh, just by searching for Steinhoff, we already get a lot of stuff. Um, 
Oh, there are questions already? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, all right, that's cool. Um, there's, oops, there's stuff, stuff on Steinhoff. I just changed to sort by name. Um, what do we see on this page? So we get a list of results. That's kind of a common thing. It's that's what we are used to as users of the internet. So you can scroll this down. Obviously, there's more stuff. It's loading. Okay, what can I what can I uh, also do? I can click on one of these little facets here on the side, as we call them. I'm sorry, um, it's not the fastest at the moment. We have been doing some changes to the server, so bear with me. It might take a while to, to uh, uh, upload this. Uh, update this, sorry. Um, okay, so I can choose one of these filters here. This is just still for the basic search term of Steinhoff, right? So I can see it found Steinhoff in 80 different data sets. It found it as expected, probably a lot of them in the German Handelsregister. Then we have something called the SourceAfrica.net, which has a lot of information, especially on South African, um, yeah data sets, so to say. Um, there's something going on in Brazil. I don't know why, I have no idea. There's something going on in Florida. This is all data that you, you can filter now, but since we know that we are interested in a specific, so this has all different Steinhoffs, right? So here's Hans Steinhoff, someone who's unrelated to all this stuff, uh, probably. Then there are court cases, Deborah Steinhoff. We're not interested in these people. So what, what are we gonna do? Why not also type in the name of the, uh, CEO at the time of the company. So Marcus Joste was the head of um, of this uh, empire, and now it's only 72 results. So we do see Steinhoff and Joste now. So all of these, even if you don't see it in the snippet here, somewhere in this document, there's going to be uh, Joste as a result also. The JD group, this is also going to be interesting if you're interested in Steinhoff. Um, it's a lot of filtering that we can do now. Let's try to figure out if we can do a date filtering, for example. Okay, we are only interested in stuff from 2019 for some reason, so we want the old school stuff. Okay, this, now we filtered it down to one result, which is uh, quite good. This is manageable. So before we had more than 3000, so now we have only one, it's great. Um, what else can we do on this page? So there's a little button here, it looks like a little, kind of control menu. If I click this, I get to the advanced search menu. And this is quite cool because you can do very, very specific searches in the in the different data sets that we have in, in Aleph. So let's remove these for now. Mm, let's say we would be, for some reason, we would be interested in what Markus Joste, the CEO, did outside of the Steinhoff group. So let's say we want to know more about the, um, uh, the companies or the uh, uh, organizations where he was a board member, but outside of the Steinhoff group. So we would type in board because we want the board memberships, right? Um, then we would also probably want the exact term because we are not interested in any other Marcos or any other Joste, but we do not want Steinhoff in this case, right? So what I did is advanced search I want all the results to include board. I do not want them to include Steinhoff. And I do also want to include them this, but as an exact phrase. So not only any Marcos or any Oster, but the entire thing. And let's see. Okay, well, that's cool. It gives us four results. Uh, apparently something in Namibia. Mm, and now that we found something, let's look at one results. Okay. That's cool, that's apparently a PDF. Um, I can now start reading this if I want. I can also select the text button here and I would be able to copy stuff out of this. Um, I can expand it so I can have a better overview of what it is. Um, and I would also be able to see mentions. I'm gonna talk about this a bit, a bit later, but this basically means that I'll have recognized names or yeah, in this case, mostly names, but also company names, addresses, email addresses, phone numbers, stuff like this in documents. And we can see Marcus Jose down here, and this is why the result showed up, right? So Aleph, Aleph on its own, the software figured out that this person is named in this document. And when I was searching for it, uh, it gave me back the document. Mm. Okay. Um, one thing that's important, I'm gonna go back to the main page. Um, 
one thing that's important to to understand um, is why uh, why I'm talking why why I was talking about entities all the time. So for Aleph as a tool, uh, there's a difference between. Let's go back to. Let's just open any. Oops, sorry. Let's just open any random document. I'm going to show you the difference between this. Just the. Maybe I maybe find the other one also this way. Yeah, it's going to be fine. Okay, so um, we do have full text here. So there is there's obviously this phrase is in here, Ministry of Agriculture. There's also references here by May 2, and there's there's regular text in, in this document. And this is just normal full text search that we can do on Aleph. But if we are looking for entities, that means that there was some form of recognition of a certain text string as some basically an entity as a thing. As a thing. So um, so somewhere in this text, the, it, it says Meat Corporation of Namibia. And this is. Uh, has been realized to be a entity, in this case, a court case. So um, when we search for something, we can make a difference uh, if we, we, on this side, on this little filter on this side, we can make a difference between the, the entities that we are looking for. And the document can also be an entity, a table can be an entity. Or if I go back to the beginning and I search for Marcus Wilster, again, this is now an entity. And if I click this, this is the legal entity. It even says so, Markus Joste. And this is not a document. This is an important thing to remember. This does not mean that, that this information is necessarily directly connected to a document. So nobody ever uploaded a PDF that says Markus Joste is the director of, I don't know what this is about, of the Altstein Furniture Private Limited. This information has either been collected by a scraper or someone put it in there manually, or it was extracted from a different set of documents and now lives in Aleph on, on its own, basically. So th th that's a different between, difference between entities and documents um, or full text in this case. Um, I'm sorry, this is a little bit technically uh, complicated, but it's kind of important. So um, yeah, um, let's go back here. Uh, okay, let's go talk about search as a summary a little bit. If you have any questions regarding search, you can post them to chat now or um, maybe ask them, I don't know. Um, my suggestion would be to start off with a very broad search. Just type in whatever you're interested in. Type in a list of, person, of people name, people's names, companies' names, countries, addresses, whatever you're interested in, and then go back and uh, refine your search. Um, okay, the next thing you can also do is set up alerts for something. So let's go back here. Let's redo the one that we did. So board, none of these words, Steinhoff. Oops. And the exact phrase of Markus Joost. Oops. Sorry. Uh, a question from a journalist via signal. We often have issues. I'm just going to read. So we have a little chat window here, and uh, there's a question coming in. Uh, we often have issues about metadata when it comes to court cases. How does Aleph help us? Um, I can talk, I will talk about court cases later on and how you can. Um, in your own investigations, how you can basically manage to, to get an overview over a list of court cases. Um, the Aleph data model has court case as an entity type. So you can have your own little profile like we saw with the Yoster profile or like we saw with the one over here, like the one here on the, on the left-hand side. You can have a profile like this. This one is a profile for an organization, but you can also have a profile for a court case. This will have the relevant information. Obviously, the information, the properties are going to be different. A court case does not necessarily have an address. It does not have an email. 
but you will right. be able to generate these types um, of profiles. I, I, I think the journalist was referring to emails and documents, PDFs, that kind of thing. And I know on Aleph, it shows you the properties of who authored the emails yeah. uh, and that sort of thing. So that does help when it comes to any uh, legal cases, right? Because the journalist say, according to the data, um, this is who authored it. It wasn't tampered or fabricated. Oh yeah, absolutely. So Aleph will preserve the metadata. We can, um, for example, see, see this here. So there's a little like info tab over here and it shows you all the relevance, even the technical stuff. So there's a checksum. That means there's a algorithm that um, you can compare to a, a, another version of the document. It will show you if it's, it has been changed or manipulated. You can even see on which document printer, I think, or scanner, that's probably the scanner's name. This was made on which date. Um, you might have an author's name here. If this was a, let's say, for example, a Word document or an email, you would you would also have the other metadata here. So this all is preserved and um, it won't be changed. Um, all right, alerts. <clears throat> Let's do a lot alerts quickly. It's uh, quite straightforward. So you have your search. Uh, we search for Markus Joost, the board member, who is also a board member somewhere somewhere else outside of the Steinhoff universe. And this is something we are, for some reason, really interested in. So what can we do? We can click this little thing here that looks like a I don't know, like a Wi-Fi signal. And just by clicking here, I'm going to re receive an email once or every time a new document is uploaded to Aleph in the, in the sphere of data sets that I have access to, of course. So if I, upload, if I uploaded it to my personal uh, investigation and you have the alert, you won't see it unless I share it with you. But if someone uploads it to the wider audience or if it's scraped by a scraper, which is automatically made accessible to a lot of people, then just by clicking this little button over here, I will get an email notification that says, hey, someone put new stuff on uh, your search term into Aleph, please have a look. And it will give you the link to the document also, which is a really cool thing. So we, of course, encourage you to come back to Aleph all the time and spend your entire workday in this software. But if you don't want to do this, you can also set up um, your email alerts. And I know that some people, some users are really, really uh, going like into detail with these. So some people have a lot of email alerts and a very elaborate system to get new information or updates on companies, on uh, business people they are interested in, on criminals, whatever, right? So just by clicking this little button here, it just basically means whenever something so shows up in this search, I will get the email to this. All right, let's go back to filter. We did do this. So what's next on our list? We are going to talk about export list search results. Do we have more questions? Nope. Okay. Um, uh, export search results. Also one little button does a lot of things. One thing, but a very important thing. You can just click this button and then in the background, um, Aleph is going to start collecting all the documents for your search and cre creating a little uh, export link for you. So I click this now. Uh, I encourage you not to do this too often because this is honestly very stressful for, for the system. Um, but if you need for some reason to, for example, give documents to someone who's doing fact checking at your organization or some colleague who for some reason does not have access to Aleph or is working on a different type of system where the person cannot access outside websites or something like this. It does happen sometimes. Then you would want to um, export your, your results. And um, this is gonna take a little while. We might come back to this later, but, um, oh, it's successful already. Oh, great, because it's only it's only a small export. But uh, on your main page, so I just clicked on the top left here to get back to this main page. And then here I have all my uh, alerts. And then here I have all my exports, right? And this is just the search that I just created. And I can click it now. It's going to start a little download. And I have a zip uh, file with all the documents that are relevant to this search. Uh, in this case, because we only had four results, it was really quickly. If you do this for something that has, I don't know, 3000 results, it's gonna take a long time. It's gonna create a lot of data. So be a little bit careful with this, but um, yeah, do whatever you need to do. Mm. 
All right, cool. So yeah, start your search filter, set your alerts for whatever you need. Um, export your stuff if you have to. This is basically the search part of Aleph and the Google-like qualities of this software. And a lot of our users uh, only use this, which is fine. So you don't have to do your own stuff. You don't have to upload your own investigation. A lot of our users mostly focus on this and get great results from it, I hope. Um, but um, yeah, the next step is what, where, where Aleph is going to be really powerful. So we already talked about uh, talked about entities a little bit. Let's go back to this. Okay. So what what, what can I do with with an with an entity or what is an entity? Um, I'm going to show you this as, as an example. I'm going to create a new investigation. So if I click, let me do this again. I'm here in my main page. Uh, I have data sets here. These are data sets that have this little lock padlock thing here. That means you can't change them. It's not your stuff, it's our stuff, basically. It's what we as an organization, OCCRP, um, uploads to Aleph and gives to people. Um, um, you can work with this, you can search this, but you can't really do anything on it. You can't make changes, you can't delete documents, you cannot add doc documents. Um, if you wanna do this, you have to click on investigations on this side. And this is your personal workspace. And you see that this is a demo account. We've been using this for trainings in the past. So there's a, there's a demo for today, which I already created, which, which we are gonna have a look at, but I can also show you how to create a new investigation. You basically just click, click here, uh, give it a title, demo title, fill out all the met metadata and I'm not going to do this right now because I'm lazy, but you should obviously do it. Um, then you can already share it with someone. Let's maybe share it with data at OCCRP.org, which is a user that exists. I know this because we use it a lot for stuff. It's our uh, internal uh, account, but if your colleague has an account with us, you can share it with your colleague and then you can save it. And this is how what it looks like if you start a new demo investigation. Um, this is your space. Uh, it, the, the stuff lives on our servers, yeah, but it's not nobody, no other user unless you share it with uh, another person is going to be able to see this, um, look at your documents, play around with your stuff. It's just it's your space. You can do whatever you want here. You can upload as many files as you want. Um, I don't know if I should say this, but <laughs> we don't have a we don't have a upload limit at the moment. You, I think you can upload as much as you like. Um, this is especially useful for, um, let's say, medium-sized investigations where you have, I don't know, someone gave you five hundred PDF documents. What are you going to do? And you want to search through all of them as soon as as quick as possible. Someone gave you a zip file that has uh, 500 Excel documents in it. So there's even a level of nesting. Uh, this is perfect. So Aleph can handle this stuff. If you have larger investigations or larger sets of documents that go into the gigabytes or into even, even beyond this, you should probably talk to us because we have different ways to ingest data into Aleph as well. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to go through this and upload uh, hundred thousands of documents. If you have a large investigation, you can talk to us and then we will help you with this. But if you have a small or medium sized investigation or something that you want to share with, I don't know, two, three, four, five colleagues, this is perfect for you. Um, all right, so let's create an entity. Uh, I prepared something for, for this, um, but since our servers are a bit stressed today, I'm gonna use the one that I did earlier today. I'm not gonna upload it live right now, but all I did was create an uh, investigation like this Then click here, upload document. I put it in the documents here and that's it. So basically it's very straightforward. You don't have to see it. Um, all right, this is the demo investigation that I did. And um, I uploaded a couple of documents here, different types of documents. So, Let's see, what are we gonna start with? So one document that I uploaded is just a random report from the World Bank about mining. It's a PDF file, it's quite large, seven megabytes. So 
there's going to be images in there. So what did Aleph do to it? Let's click it and then we can see. So first of all, we do have the metadata on the site, right? This is what we talked about before. So in this case, you do even see the author, the person who wrote this thing. Then there's a checksum that is important to um, make sure it's, the integrity is kept. So if someone has the same document, the person can give you the checksum. And if the checksum matches, that means that every single not even every single letter, but every single byte in this computer file is going to be um, the same in the two documents. That was done with the old version of Acrobat, which is, we don't we don't care too much about. And then I have a preview of the document, so I can start scrolling through this. Yeah, not going to be too interesting now. Um, I can also have uh, click on the text layer here, so we can see already now. Uh, this is the title page. So there's not too much text on it, but. We go to a lot of type pages here. We go to a full page, uh, full text page. We see that Aleph extracted all the text from the document, which is which is quite cool. Um, okay, what did it also do? It created these mentions. So Aleph went through the document and counted how many times certain names were mentioned, and these are basically like entities in light. So even though this is a document on mining, which has the, the term mining industry, for example, a lot, I guess, it's not in here because Aleph did not think that it was an entity. It was not a thing. Entities, the, the, the easy translation for entities is thing. So it figured out that Wolfgang Fengler is probably gonna be a person. So this is why this is here or that do we have something else? Yeah, the gold mining industry is here. So this is probably a uh, this is probably an association of kinds. Um, the archives of, okay, whatever, well, they are here. This is gonna be considered an organization of kinds as well. So it did go through the document automatically after I uploaded it and created those first findings, the European Union, the World Bank, these are all organizations. And we can also do this ourselves. Um, I'm gonna show you this for a different document now. Um, oh, let me go back to, to how Aleph automatically recognizes text from a document first, sorry. I'm gonna show you this. So this is also a, a nice photo that I stole from the internet. And I just wanted to show you that the text recognition not only works on PDF files, but also on other files as well. So um, this photo also has a text text button here. And we, as we can see, the text that was on, on, the, on the little sign, the road sign is also in Aleph because the system recognized that there was text in it. So it also works for pictures as well. And this is especially handy if you, this happens a lot uh, if someone gives you, I don't know, a couple of photos that the person took with a mobile phone from documents and then just quickly snapped a couple of photos. It would usually, not in all cases, depends on the image quality, of course, but it would usually give you the text or um, at least most of the text. Uh, yeah, this is just why I had this JPEG in there. So even from something that's clearly not a document, it would figure out the text from this. Um, okay, what else do we have here? We do have a Excel file here. It's something that I copied from the Luanda Leaks data and it's a table. It's a table, it has company names, it has company jurisdictions, it has incorporation dates, it has a lot of stuff. So we know this, this basically is a, this is something that a company would keep to keep track of uh, their own, their own subsidiaries, for example, and who legally, technically is the owner of these or the shareholder in this case. Um, and we can do something really cool now. We can generate entities from this. I just, so I'm here, right? Um, see how Aleph did not automatically create any mentions from this because it's a spreadsheet and we have to do it manually but it gives us a lot more power to, or a lot more control over the process. So I can go here and generate entities. And then I got to define a few things. So I know that we have companies in this thing. Here's, an, here's by the way, here's a 
preview of the document so I can always go back here. So what defines the company in this document? Well, the company name, obviously. Then I guess the industry, industry also, and maybe the incorporation, date. it should be enough already. Uh, we also have in this column over here, no here, we have the shareholder. So the shareholder is in this case, a person It could also be another company. Um, let's just do a person now. What defines this person in this document? This is called a mapping, by the way. We look at the document and we tell the computer, hey, this column has this information, this column has this information. It might, it might seem a bit complicated right now, but if you see the results, it's, it's a really cool thing. It's definitely worth uh, spending 10, 15 minutes trying this out, maybe reading documentary uh, documentation again, mm, but it's a really helpful thing to do. Um, all right, the person is defined by the column of shareholder and maybe even the shareholder date. That means when the shareholder took over the company, or oh, let's just name it, let's just only use the name, it's gonna be fine. And then there's a relationship that we can define. So we define two objects on the left side. We have two objects in this table, companies and shareholders, and we have a relationship between those two and this relationship. These are all different relationships that you can use in Aleph. Uh, the relationship that we are gonna use is ownership. And this is defined by, um, let's say shareholder date maybe. And then the owner is in this case, the person and the asset is the company. All right, so this is the important stuff. Uh, we define the objects, entities, things, whatever you want to call them, and the relationship between those. And, and we can also say what which column means, what property is in these columns, company jurisdiction, company incorporation date. I'm going to be a little bit quicker over these things because they are technical and might be boring to some, but as I said, it, I think it's worth uh, taking a look at it. I'm just going to show you basically how it works and then you can recreate it yourself if you want. Uh, the person is going to be the shareholder and there's a, oh no, shareholder is here, sorry. And the person has a name, the company also has an industry, we can also leave this out, it's not important. We don't have to use all of these. And the ownership has a start date in this case. All right, so this gives us an overview. It's basically a repetition of what we just did before. We can also add a fixed value. For example, in this case, we know that all the people in this are from, oops, from Angola. Don't have to do this. And we can click generate entities. And what we now did, and it's, it says generating entities now, that might take a while, maybe two, three minutes. What we now did is that we defined in this, in this uh, Excel file, in this case, that we uploaded to Aleph. Uh, we, could, we could have searched through this document before. We could just have typed in names of companies over here or over here, and this document would show up. But it would not necessarily immediately be clear as a user for a human what the connection between, let's say, a shareholder Isabel dos Santos in this case and the Ali Motion Holdings is. Uh, you would still have to go into the document and figure this out. And now that we define these entities, and they now live in our investigation, but outside of this document, and I'm going to show you what I mean by this. Um, so. We defined a couple of companies. And now these, this is a new table. It's different from the other table. It's automatically generated. And it gives you gives us a uh, lot of, um, yeah, well, basically the entities right now. And we can, let's have a look at one of these. So it already started to create some, uh, how are these, what are these called? Histogram thing. So you already get the information from the date column, get it generated here nicely. Um, also started extracting some other stuff from this. Let me refresh this because it should give us uh, should give us uh, companies here in a second. Sorry, as I said, the servers are not the fastest today. I'm going to go back to the other. Uh, um, 
maybe let's give it another try. Okay. So, uh, did we define the other one as people? As person? Okay, well, they are here, so they will show up here. Ah, okay, now they're here. We have companies now. All right, so um, why did I go through all this? Why did I make this so extremely complicated? Here's the answer for you. Now that we did this and we defined these entities, we have little profiles for, only from this table that I generated. There's no extra information. It's only from the table that I, that I generated here. And if we look at these profiles, this is much easier to, uh, this is a bad example because we have both here and they both are both the owners. <laughs> Um, let's find one that only has one owner. Uh, yeah, this one, okay. Um, all right, so now before I only had my table and my one line about the Europe Margaret Pipeline Limited, now I have this little profile. I have the incorporation date. I have ownership information. I even have similar companies that are also in other data sets that I did already do already have access in this case, the Luanda leaks, which was expected because I took this table from there. But if you have your own investigation, obviously um, this would be a really interesting information for you if something was also mentioned somewhere else. And we do have the owner and the owner in this case is uh, Sika Ducolo, I think the partner of um, Isabel Los Santos. And I can also move from here and click this profile and I will have another uh, this is also an entity now, the person entity in this case. If we had more information like a birth date in our table or nationality, which we don't have in this case, but which is, it's very common to have these lists where you would have company information on one side and then a lot of other personal information of the owner on the other side. And this would also show up here and I have this profile now. If we wait a bit longer, this then all the companies are gonna show up here in this person. This is some. This is much easier and much more approachable as compared to just an Excel table that has the stuff in it. And this is now part of the entity of Syndicato Colo or the profile, the thing, whatever you want to call it. Also, again, we can click on similar here, which is already the cross-referencing, which I'm going to show you in a second. And I figure out that there's more stuff. He's in Thomson Reuters work check, for example or in the Malta business registry. I can, it's now obviously I can click here and um, would find what, what information is in the other data set about this person. So I now have addresses, well, I didn't have this before. I have a registration number and stuff like this. So yeah. Um, um, oops, sorry, I have to click here. Um, mentions here. All right, it gives also gives me a nice overview of things. So uh, most mentioned names, we have the, it's not updated now. Okay, we, we should have the number of companies and the number of owners here. This is gonna, as I said, this is a server issue. It usually needs five, 10 minutes to, to be updated. Okay, shall we do a little recap of what entities are? I'm gonna go back to the slides and then, um, all right, as I, as I said, I'm, I'm a bit sorry that this is a technical part of the presentation, but it really, I think it's worth going through it. And I'm gonna show you in a second what else you can do with it. This is more of the experimental stuff that you can do in Aleph. But um, entity for us basically means we extract information or a profile of a thing. Mostly living things could also be, uh, living things, people in this case, <laughs> uh, could also be a company. It could be an airplane. We could have a profile for a court case, which we talked about before. And you can actually go a little bit crazy with these. This was a very simple mapping, but I'm I'm going to really quickly show you another one that I did earlier. Um, if we go to investigations and then there's this little demo. Um, uh, it's not loading. Okay, go. Come. We're going to come back to this in a second. So um, these entities are usually, or uh, do have a number of properties. Usually, they do have some identifying information, obviously. So a name, an identity number, stuff like this. 
Um, but then the properties differ a lot from the type of entity. So obviously an airplane would have different properties that describe the airplane than compared to a bank account, which is kind of clear. And this is Aleph's way to store and connect structured data. And this, uh, this is what makes it so different from unstructured data, which is just a block of text. So if you just have a block of text, you would never be able to create such a profile or it would be really hard to create such a profile from it. But if you have the entity uh, information that we just defined in the mapping, then it's going to be much easier for the computer also to make these comparisons. Let's look at this one. This maps um, this maps uh, court cases and the relationship. So as you can see, this is a different table. I uploaded this. You don't have to you don't have to read what's in there. Really, it's not important. It's just an example. Um, so we have people in a court case, we have the court case itself and we have the organization, which are the uh, courts in this case. And then we have different types of relationships and you can really go a little bit crazy and give this, this could, could go on even longer. And then you can make a bit more complicated mapping. And um, this will help you do stuff like this, which I'm gonna show you now, because you can't own, not only can you create these profiles, but you can also, Oh, do we have any do we have any questions regarding these entities? Because I know that this is a complicated thing. Uh, okay, now I can show you the more advanced part stuff that you can use them for. Um, you can create diagrams from this. Uh, this is also built into Aleph. So I'm again, I'm going to go back. This is the main page of my investigation. Um, we have a little tab here that says network diagram and I can create a new diagram. In this case, let's just, let's just look at the court cases because it's a li little bit more exciting than the uh, Rwanda leaks data, but we can do, do this with all stuff, whatever we, whatever we upload, um, can do this. All right, so this is an empty, empty diagram now and I'm just gonna add my first document uh, and I know that there's the high court, what is it called? I'm a person, sorry, I selected the wrong type. Um, okay, the high court of Mombasa, it's in there, I just do this. Um, Okay, now I have my little entity here. Uh, does it help me? No. But what does help me is that if I double click it, discover all links, and I click here, it just gives me this automatically generated little diagram of things. So this is, I did not define this by hand. So I did not go to Aleph and say, hey, the uh, high court of Mombasa is connected to court case. These are different numbers of court cases in this case. Um, um, court case 188 of 99. I did not manually do this. This is this has been done by the rather complicated mapping that we looked at, and the mapping said, "Hey, if this is in one line in the di in the in the table, then these are connected." And from here, I can move forward. I can also say dif discover all links of this, and this is going to give me the person that is in the court case. It's also going to give me maybe I don't know in this case maybe oops sorry. Maybe it's gonna give me more. Do we have more? Yeah, uh, he was in another court case, okay. So we have another court case as well. And this, I can I can do this uh, over and over again, and then this is gonna be a, a very complicated graph in the end. <laughs> but I hope you understand how this is an easier and more approachable way as compared to a a uh, very boring Excel table type of thing and how this is gonna be really helpful um, if you do your investigations, if you want to figure out who's in, who's connected to whom and who's owning companies together with whom. And this, um, this can also go over multiple documents, obviously. So if you don't have one um, Excel file, but you maybe have 10 or 15 Excel files, they would all go into the same set of entities for your investigation and then you can um, compare all these. Mm. Just one second, one, yeah, one second about timelines. This is an experimental feature, but you can still try to use it. It's not great. It has some bugs right now, but it, 
um, something that we are working on. So this is something I created earlier. We do have a feature now that's called a timeline where you can create these little entries also from your, from your entities. So here's the high court of Mombasa again, or Deluxe Motors Limited. I made all this up, right? But this could be a real investigation. And um, this would help you bring into order the, uh, or into a chronological order, the events that you are looking at. So in this case, I made up the police investigations or police surveillance that was going on. And then someone met someone else. I have this information from a source, for example. And then there's a court date. And this, uh, you can imagine if this thing had 50 entries or maybe 100 entries, it would help a lot to get an overview of the chronological order. The cool thing is, if I go back now, so I know that Deluxe Motors Limited is in this thing here, right? Because I, I added this entity as involved. And if I go back to my network diagram and I uh, I add Deluxe Motors Limited over here and discover all the links, it's also going to show me the stuff that I just created in the timeline, right? So there's the owner of company has a secret meeting. This is just the entry that we had before. And I can look at when this happened and where this happened. Again, this is all made up. Um, I can, if I want to maybe make this red because it's a person now, so it's a bit easier to distinguish. Um, yeah, this is how we use entities in this, in the, basically in the second stage of investigation. So when you really start digging into stuff. Um, one last easy thing uh, about entities is cross-referencing. This is what we already saw in the case of one individual it's the same inf information as we saw before for one individual entity, but you, here you have an overview. So I'll show you again, I'm, I'm here on my overview page and then there's this, this little thing here that says cross-reference. This case, 10 only, it's not, not too many, but still it's gonna be interesting. So this is the person or the entity that's in, on our side of things in our investigation. And this is where Aleph found something else or some someone else that matches this thing in the first uh, column over here. So let's go down. Do we have to have something that's not extremely clear? No, they are all, all kind of clear. Yeah, so these are all probably the same. Sometimes you would find instances where Aleph only found the same last name, maybe a different first name where you personally have to make a decision. And then you for yourself and for your own investigation can say, yeah, this is the same. This is the same. This is probably not the same. I'm, Again, making this up, it's not important right now. Uh, I'm not sure about this. Uh, so yeah, you can kind of evaluate this information. This is gonna help us so uh, to improve the algorithm for the matching. So we can we can later on figure out um, why or, or in how many cases uh, Aleph was correct for the prediction and in how many cases it was not correct. So this is also gonna be helpful for us, but it's also gonna be helpful for you because you can now work with the information from the other investigation as well. So um, I would also have the additional information in the profile of Mr. Uh, Vavero here. So this comes from a different data set, right? You remember the original table that we work with? All this information was not in there and it's now part of my investigation. I can you now work with this. Uh, all righty. Um, yeah. Little summary for investigation. So what can you do? Uh, upload your own stuff, make them searchable, create and you can upload whatever you want basically. Aleph takes a lot of things. Uh, not all types of files, but a lot of files. So um, if I go back here, I can show you again back here. I think I uploaded a, oops, wrong. That's the demo investigation, sorry. Um, so I uploaded a zip file. It, Aleph automatically extracts the zip file and shows me what's in there. And in this zip file, for example, are PDF files again, and they are again, readable and searchable like other PDF files, like they were not in a zip file. So you don't have to unzip everything, right? Just throw it in. Same is true for certain types of emails that it can read or um, we'll be able to display video files, for example, or um, audio files. Um, yeah, create your entities from your spreadsheet. It's a painful process, I know. I'm sorry for that, but uh, it kind of has to be. 
uh, cross-reference with other data sets, share investigation with your colleagues and create networks and timelines. Mm. Was a little bit of a rough ride, but uh, I feel like it's better to show this uh, and be quick and go over it. So you have seen it once and then you can ask questions, ask me, ask Khadisha maybe, I don't know, um, uh, or read the documentation other than not being able to see this at all. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I, I should add that we, just the, the one thing we are still um, trying to find more data, especially for African investigation. So if, uh, my email address is right here. So if you have anything uh, that we should include in our data sets, please let me know or let any one of us is here, please, uh, staff know. Great. Uh, we had two very quick questions for you that you need to answer in 10 seconds. Where African journalists are the uh, Aleph database and certain data sets are restricted, do they then just write into Aleph and request access to these data sets? Secondly, um, Aleph as a research component where people who want to access data from Mauritius or Malta or the United States and don't necessarily know how to do it or have the funds to pay for it, can uh, the investigative dashboard researchers sort these queries out for them? And then we have to wrap in 36 seconds. Okay, the answer to the first question is yes. If you are on any side of Aleph and you click the about button here, there's a section that says applying for access as journalists and then you can fill this out and then you probably get access like in very few cases uh, when it's not clear if you're a reporter or maybe just someone who's working at a bank and wants this all this stuff and I say no but in most cases we say yes and yeah the other the answer to the other question is if you go to id.org uh, you can file a request here for example for data uh, for uh, um, company registries that are restricted and you will probably get an answer Hopefully, the colleagues do have a lot of work to do. So, yeah, with them. Uh, one more question: Can NGOs also get access to the data? For example, Open Secrets in South Africa, yeah. they do investigative work, Shadow yes. World. So, NGOs that do investigations can get access. There's a second section for researchers, activists, NGOs, anyone who's close to journalism, but not not necessarily a uh, investigative journalist, can fill out this thing, and then they will also get access. The data sets differ a little bit, but yeah, the short answer is yes. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Jan, and thank you uh, AIJC for hosting the session.